Thank you very much. Um, I must admit, when I, by the way, how much time do we have? Um, because I know that we're running a little bit over time. I'll, I'll wait until I'm flagged um, a little bit later on, I guess. I must admit, I was feeling a little bit nervous when I was first, intro uh, first asked to, to give this, um, to host this, this, co this conversation because, well, for a start, Justice Leonin is one of the most uh, respected jurists in this country. But also, uh, the last time I was in a room with a judge, I got seven years in prison. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great honor, as I just said. Uh, and for those, I'm sure everybody in the room knows um, Justice Leonin's background far better than I do, but I want to just run through a few things uh, for his background. He's an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, as we've just heard. He was also the Chief Peace Negotiator in Mindanao um, with the Moral Liber Islamic Liberation Front. He was also Dean of the Philippines College of Law. He also ran an environmental law practice, I understand, and before that, you set up a legal and advocacy institution that was focused on poor communities. Now, this is an extraordinary record, but you're not without your critics. Um, and I was looking through, uh, when I was Googling, um, I found uh, one commentator in the Manila Times, uh, one Rigoberto Tigolo, and <laughs> yeah, everyone loves this. You, you're gonna love this, I have, to, I have to read this out. He described, he said, Leonin is a living reminder No, I, I think Leon, I think uh, Rigoberto Tigalao would love me for saying this. He said, Leonin is a living reminder to the nation never ever to put such an incompetent as President Benino Aquino, who appointed an incompetent to a crucial institution of our republic. He also said, there is something deeply wrong with Leonin. He has a megalomaniacal streak. <laughs> so, a megalomaniac we have with us, ladies and gentlemen. This is, yeah, it's worth an applause. <laughs> worth a round of applause. Uh, thank, thank you, Peter. And I was about to refer to that uh, news article sometime in the conversation. But I guess uh, I was uh, intrigued by your forum and I accepted the invitation principally because I do miss the academic. I miss the academic discussion and I miss to talking to other people. Uh, in a genuine conversation, uh, challenging at that. And uh, perhaps I should open by asking uh, questions to, to you. And uh, let me start with a quote. And this quote is from Oliver Wendell Holmes. And I guess this is a, a often repeated quotation uh, coming from a descent of Oliver Wendell Holmes. You see, many justices are remembered not because of their ponentia or their main opinion, but by the, their descent. This is from U.S. versus Schwimmer in 1929. Schwimmer was a pacifist who refused to take an oath to the United States of America uh, for his citizenship because he said that he was not going to take up arms to protect the United States of America. And the question was whether he should be given citizenship because of the speech that he, that he made. And here is the quote coming from Wendell Holmes, Oliver Wendell Holmes. If there is any principle of the Constitution that more imperatively calls for attachment than any other, it is the principle of free thought. Not free thought, thought for those who agree with us, but freedom for the thought that we hate. For freedom for the thought that we hate. And the forum now is about false news, uh, false information, the thought that perhaps some of you have grown to hate, the thought that many of us hate, yes, uh, that I've been called stupid and ignorant and incompetent many times over by uh, many people. And my question, therefore, is, is there a constitutional value in protecting against false speech? Perhaps I should open with that. Well, you've been dealing with this for quite some years, and one of the things that we've been talking about, what we heard in the last session, was, was the, the kind of continuity of, of threats to free speech. You've been fighting this, this corner for quite some time. Do you see echoes now from the kind of fights that you were prosecuting some years ago, decades ago? Uh, yes, and... Uh one thing I find out now in looking at your program is that I find myself in a very unique position. 
Um, perhaps if I were not a justice of the Supreme Court, I would be sitting with you in the audience. But the thing now is I'm a public officer. And I guess uh, from, from, uh, from another point of view, I now stand to be at the being critic side, the, the, the receiving end of uh, your criticism. And um, well, there are many things that we want to prevent uh, that happens, like for example, again, disinformation and false speech. And uh, perhaps uh, right now being discussed in many forums, including the legislature, is whether or not it is timely to actually look at uh, the role of the law, the role of statutes, the role of the courts in looking at whether to stop false information in the context that we have now. It is not a simple question. Well, if you have a liberal streak, then it might look simple to you. Of course not. Why should you regulate false speech? But then on the other hand, I heard your uh, several panels this morning. I was monitoring through the live feeds of uh, your, uh, of different groups. And I guess there are a lot of opinion that you do not agree with and a lot of opinion that you think false. But there seems to be a uh, dichotomy between a false fact on the one hand and a false opinion on the other. And I guess a false opinion has always been something that is verifiably wrong. For example, that somebody was born not in um, a abroad but born in the Philippines, that can be verifiable. Uh, those are facts, uh, perceivable that I am talking to uh, Peter, not talking to some other person, That's, that, that is verifiable. But you see, the problem go comes into, which, how, into how you find out whether something is true or not. Because some things are easy to verify. For example, that I'm talking to Peter, Peter is here. But then on the other hand, there are some facts where you need institutions or evidence in order to be able to verify that fact. For example, the academe. For example, media. For example, the courts, to verify whether a certain fact is true. Uh, that, for instance, X stole this amount of money from the public coffers. So you would want to rely on a media outfit uh, that actually goes through a process that you have described in, uh, this morning and probably uh, uh, mandated by journalistic ethics uh, looking at the other side, validating your information, making clear that your slant is still true, or your lead sentence or your, your word, the words that you use accurately por portray it. And on the other hand, you want to, to also look at perhaps what courts will say, and therefore you have to rely on the independence of the courts. But then what happens in a society when our, uh, the, ins the traditional institutions that guard the truth, and I can identify three, so I've identified two, journalists, media. The second is courts. I, I flag a third, the academic community. What happens if these communities become skewed, become less independent, become challenged, become threatened? What happens in that, uh, that kind of a society? What do you want law to do? What do you want your courts to do? Again, I cannot answer that. Uh, it's a question that I leave for you, Peter. In fact, this was a question that was asked of me earlier. To what extent do we regulate? And, and, and let me ask you, let me ask you, let me take the question further forward. Has the, the role of the law become more complicated because of the internet? Definitely. Um, nowadays, uh, the role of law has become more difficult uh, because the premises that we had in the 1920s, this was the environment of Oliver Wendell Holmes, are not similar to the premises that we have now. Um, I, I flag a case. This is Diocese of Bacolod versus uh, Comelec. And you remember, I think, the incident in that case. I can talk about it now because it's part of our jurisprudence. And I had the privilege to write the opinion of the court uh, in that particular case. Um, therefore, I am very familiar with it. And this was tarpaulins posted by the Diocese of Bacolod in their cathedral. You remember two tarpaulins listing candidates. One said Tim Patay and the other one said Tim Buhay. And Comelec wanted to regulate it. Comelec wanted to regulate it because they said 
that is campaign paraphernalia for and against a candidate, for or against a candidate, and campaign para paraphernalia should only be in posters that are three by six. You know how big three by six posters are. And the court was therefore faced with a situation of whether to allow that kind of speech regulated by government, limited by government into three by six pictures. And if you read that case, it looks into the complexity of content-based regulation, regulating on the basis of a content, timpatay, timbuhay, and the challenge that this was being regulated allegedly because they wanted to equalize the space for those that participated in the political forum. In the end, the court allowed it. In the end, it said, applying the rules on election paraphernalia to a diocese, which is not part, which is not uh, running for office, is therefore a violation of speech because there is this concept of equalizing space in the public forum. I mean, uh, there is this uh, narrative of uh, the marketplace of ideas, and this is classic jurisprudence. Okay, what if in the mar marketplace somebody brings a megaphone? Or what if in the marketplace somebody sings with an amplifier? And a song is emotive, a song is dramatic, and what if in the marketplace of ideas, suddenly you have an entire PETA group coming in and staging a play, drowning the voice of others? What should government do under those circumstances? Perhaps a better question is, can you trust government to do the right thing under those circumstances? And what if what comes in is not a conservative group, but a progressive group shouting to high heavens, that the status quo has drowned out their voices for many years, and therefore now they're bringing a megaphone with them. Um, I think for those of you that graduated from the University of the Philippines, every graduation, there is always those streamers, and it is expected, and it is not a UP graduation without those streamers. I am not suggesting that in Ateneo, you do, you do that in your graduation. You've, you've, you've just described the, some of the complexities around imposing or, or using the law to regulate speech. What about regulating government? Yes. Um, I mean, this is this is one of those areas, and of course, um, I have to we have to acknowledge that you've also been you've made a lot of dissenting opinions. Most recently, just a couple of days ago, in the government's application to extend uh, martial law in Mindanao, and, and um, Justice Leonan has said that you can't speak about this because there are some ongoing issues, legal issues surrounding that. So I'm going to broaden it out more generally, but because the government tends to want to use the law to silence those that it, or, and has, a, has had a tendency to want to use the law to silence its critics. To what extent do you regulate government's own speech? Um, well, it's in our constitution, and let me just share with you, I think you personally feel this whenever you're trolled you want to do everything and anything just to remove the troll. Uh, and blocking is not enough. I have a Twitter feed and daily I would block maybe four or five on the average, maybe tomorrow it will become 10 to 15, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it depends on, the, depends on the issue. You know the feeling when you are uh, trolled, when you are cyber bullied, you want to do anything and everything. Now imagine that you have the power, that you can actually do that that you can actually order somebody, that you can actually find ways and means, maybe use the intelligence apparatus to find out about this guy, uh, out this person, out this, uh, this uh, anonymous uh, web page, in order to be able to try to stop what it is that is happening. Ladies and gentlemen, that kind of tendency is what is guarded against by our constitution. And that provision is very familiar to you. It is in section four of article three, and I think common to many of the constitutions uh, of many of the nationalities that are here. Uh, no law shall be passed abridging the freedom of expression or of the press, um, or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble, to, re uh, to petition the government for redress of grievances. And, and yet, yes. sorry, I just want to hold you up because you said it, there, was a dis there was another case last year um, around Senator Leila de Lima on drugs charges, and in that, in your dissenting opinion, then you said, quintessentially, the use. Uh, uh, you, you said this was quintessentially the use of the strong arm of the law to silence dissent. Yes. So, freedom of expression is really the guard of the citizens against government using its powers, 
Uh, and it's a whole slew of uh, powers. It can be coercive, it can be cultural, it can be government speech in order to be able to silence its critics. So therefore, freedom of expression is a guard against government. Now, I, wa I wanted to focus on this for a while because a lot of the problems on this information is disagreements also with private citizens, with private groups. It is also about um, disagreements with people who enjoy the status quo, but do not reside in government or have very little, if any, connections with government, being able to use their voice. But the freedom of expression clause is really for government and to uh, prevent government from actually stopping speech uh, due to its content. There are two types. One type is prior restraint, and this is classic censorship. Government prevents you from speaking even before you've spoken. And there are many variations of these kinds of, uh, kinds of speech. I read an editorial this morning in the Manila Times. And uh, uh, freedom for the thought we hate. So therefore, I would read Manila Times daily. Uh, as much as I read Inquirer, Rappler, uh, New York Times, The Guardian, and uh, well, the past weeks, my favorites have been the articles written by Peter. But now, uh, <laughs> The point now is that it did say that there can be prior restraint in case you stop a person from speaking even if you do not want or you predict that you do not want the speech of that person. The second part is subsequent punishment. That when that person has spoken and you impose a penalty on that person, like 400 days of imprisonment, no matter what, then it can have a chilling effect. And that too is sort of a violation of speech unless there is a substantial and compelling government interest that allows you to do so. And there is a balancing test there, and the courts have not yet found really the balance, and it goes on a case-to-case -case basis. So that is how we hold government uh, accountable. Um, we're going to take, we're going to change the format a little bit. We are going to take some questions from the floor, and I wonder if there's an usher who can grab the microphone. Do you just take the microphone. Before we get to the questions from the floor, um, there is something I wanted to pull you up on. You mentioned we need to check the government or act as a restraint on governments in positions on free speech. But the one thing that keeps coming up and the one thing that brought us unstuck is the question of national security, public security, public safety and security, which is the thing that keeps, keeps being referred to when governments want to silence dissent. And, and in fact, that was one of the, fun, the underlying issues around um, Mindanao the extension of, of, of martial law in Mindanao, that this was about national security and it becomes very difficult to challenge that. Where, where do those limits lie under the law? Um, you know, national security has always been a traditional exemption, but it is not a broad-based exemption. Um, national security has been exe an exemption to censorship on prior restraint. And in many cases, um, in the United States, it's near versus Minnesota, and in the Philippines, we have incorporated it. There are instances where there, are, there is an imminent and grave threat to the state that it is important that media does not transmit the positions of its troops in order to be able not to telegraph it to its enemies. And in order for uh, the state to be able to do that, it should come out with narrowly tailored regulations in order to stop that kind of speech and to make that kind of implementation viable and operational. So that has always been an exception to prior restraint. Except that, of course, now, always in every case, we are looking for the balance. Is there really that danger? Uh, is that danger real? And if that danger is real, is it possible to actually present that to a court of law or should it be presented to a court of law for the court of law to exercise some level of judicial review? In the case of the Philippines, judicial review has been strengthened in Article 8, Section 1. We are now given the power, the, your Supreme Court is now given the power to check grave abuse of discretion. In fact, in the extraordinary use of the commander-in-chief powers, it's even a heightened scrutiny, as I would put in, the, in, in, in my opinions. The heightened scrutiny is in Article 7, Section 18, not only grave abuse of discretion, but whether there is sufficiency of facts to support the, uh, the actual uh, declaration. Again, national security is an iffy exception. 
because everything can be put under the rubric of national security. But definitely, maybe it is safe to say that sometimes national security is different from criticism of the person that happens to lead government. National security should be differentiated with that. There is a similar thing in the judiciary. There is a, a catena of jurisprudence that looks into whether media can be cited in contempt for its criticism of the judiciary. Um, in Rem Makasayet, for, for example, and several other cases where the Supreme Court has not yet put a bright line on how media can express its criticism of the court. By the way, a while ago, some, I heard somebody say that there should be institutions that should be free from criticism. Um, I guess from my point of view, the Constitution doesn't say so. Doesn't say so. Uh, the Philippines is a republic, republic and democratic state. Sovereignty resides in the people and all governmental authority emanates from them. Article 11, Section 1 states that public office is a public trust and it does not qualify between a judicial position and an executive or legislative position. As a matter of fact, I would say, why do we put the effort of writing all our opinions and having it published in the internet and in our reporter system? It is for all of you to read. And for all of you to say, my God, that Leonen is really stupid. That Leonen <laughs> is really incompetent. You are entitled to your opinion. Except that, of course, the Supreme Court's final decision is final. Um, Right. Let's, we're going to take some questions from the floor, as I said, um, and no lectures, just questions. <laughs> no, I, I'd like to, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but what you're saying is that, for example, if my feed was filled with fake news, uh, um, the, the law protects uh, our dissenting opinions, and therefore what I should do is ignore the fake news? Um, okay. What I'm saying is the law provides for parameters of how we act within a community. But the law does not tell you what exactly to do. The law tells you what you cannot do, but the law does not tell you what, what you should do. There is a difference between what is legal and what is legitimate. For example, that I am a member of the Supreme Court um, and I can act competently as an associate justice of the Supreme Court, but what I say, on the other hand, although I have the legal power to do so, does not necessarily mean that it will always be correct or legitimate. Gone are the days that we have kings that have divine, uh, divine right, if ever that was, that was true. Uh, gone are those days. In fact, the Constitution prohibits any title of nobility. And I wonder why the Knights of Rizal are still called the Knights of Rizal. But in any case, perhaps it's a private organization. The point being that there is a difference between what you can do with the law and what you can do with your own, uh, own feed. Um, and social media, again, is a forum which I think your court and statutes will still have to grapple with. And I think this is the ongoing discussions in Senate hearings. Is it really a public forum? Is it a private? Uh, it's a, is it a private platform? Is it a private platform imbued with public interest? Is there speech that is free, protected by the Constitution in that private forum? Can you just go out of that particular space? Okay, that's the legal question. But the ethical question, the moral question, and the, the, the question of power here is: Every time you log on to Facebook, you empower Facebook. Every time you log on to Twitter, you empower Twitter. When you repost and use that forum, you enrich at great cost because you surrender your privacy or portions of it forever. I mean, the post that you made uh, 10 years ago will always be there. And uh, true enough, Peter Googled me. And I am there. And I, we, we still, in, the, in this country, still uh, have to enforce uh, that provision in the data privacy law of the right to forget. Uh, that there is a right that you can assert against a server, maybe within the jurisdiction of the Philippines, to completely not delete, but delete several times. I don't know what it is called, really erase, because when you delete, it is still there. 
when you deactivate your Facebook, it is still there. Once in a while, I check my Facebook, and of course, it's deactivated. I, want, I just want to check what's happening in my, uh, in, my, in my wall, but then I deactivate immediately. It is still the same. It is still there. So my, my point is that it is different once you patronize social media. That's not a question of legality. That's a question of what platform are you empowering? Similar to the question, are, advertise, ad, are advertisers migrating to the popular blogs or are they keeping their money with uh, broadsheets or the digital version of broadsheets? Um, that's, a di that's not a legal question. It is more a question of what we do with the power that we have. Maria. Justice Leon, and question on um, these studies now that are being done on online state-sponsored hate that is meant to intimidate and silence. Uh, how does the Constitution, I mean, the Constitution was written obviously before all of this, but this could, is it prior restraint if it's state-sponsored? Okay. Um, you know, I do not want to inhibit in cases that might go up to the court. <laughs> And uh, I, I would just say that that is a fantastic legal question. And uh, in response to that, very generally, therefore not uh, showing whatever bias that I have, I will just read Section 4 of Article 3. No law shall be passed abridging the freedom of speech, of expression, or of the press. No law shall be passed abridging. Okay? And no law does not mean what Douglas said before, Justice Douglas of the United States. No law means a statute. It doesn't refer to an executive act. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean an alliance with the state or the agents of the state acting for the state. No law in our jurisdiction doesn't refer to a statute. It means an act. Like in Diocese of Bacolod, it was an opinion of the legal department of Comele that was served on the diocese. Okay. And what exactly does abridging mean? Traditionally, it has had two components, prior restraint and subsequent punishment. But what form of prior restraint? How do you stop it? Can you stop it simply, of course, the traditional ways government sends the army, closes down or arrests a journalist. Uh, that's the traditional way. It's painful, it's still happening, but it's the traditional way. Uh, sorry to say that it was not sophisticated on your part. But there can be other ways to do it. And I do not know, and I, do not, I cannot make a judgment now of that. Again, it will have to await a particular case that is uh, justiciable. The allegation that there is propaganda used by the, by the state. OK, let me challenge you a little. But the state provides information. And the state's information need not only be factual, because People who run government are politicians. They struggle for power. They struggle also for votes. And therefore, it is not purely verifiable facts. And with verifiable facts, well, there, it, there are different ways of verifying it. And therefore, is it by means of this that we will say the state should only state the kind of facts that we want to hear rather than facts produced in a certain way so that it reaches the broadest number. This morning, there was a PR expert in the first panel. And I was listening very intently because I want to convince my colleagues better. And I thought I heard the word sexiness, and definitely I'm not there. Uh, and many other things uh, address the emotions, uh, make it more concrete, etc. cetera. And I, f I concluded in my mind not applicable for me as I deal with my colleagues because it's a different kind of a uh, forum. But government also does that. And how far would you allow government to be able to do that in law? And what sacrifices will you make in terms of the interpretation of your fundamental freedoms in order to be able to do that? Remember, Holmes, freedom for the thought that you hate. Because at a certain time, you will be in government. You will be the ones in power. Maybe a communist, a socialist, a social, socialist democratic government trying, trying to fend off the remnants of the status quo coming in. Would you want this kind of liberal privileges to also be applicable so that government can reach out uh, 
I leave you with that question. I do not answer it because that, those are the types of conflicts that we deal with whenever we are faced with an actual case. So I haven't answered your question for the record, and I will not do so today. Okay, where's the microphone at the moment? Uh, good the evening, Your Honor. Um, yes. Hello. Can you just um, introduce yourself, by the way? Oh, hi, my name is uh, John Juliano. I'm from the office of Senator Hontiveros. Um, we know that the palace has employed bloggers as uh, part of its presidential communications team. Uh, and these bloggers have made the transition from individual influencers to public officials. Um, what does the law say about the conduct of a presidential appointee saying that, oh, you know, X opinion is not really my opinion as a public official, it's my opinion as a private individual and that's my blog. So where does, or is there, a line between the public official persona and the individual persona as present in the blog? And do we have any legal recourse for that? Uh, difficult question because I know that there might be another case that will come up uh, in relation to that. And I, will, I expected those types of questions. So again, I will read a provision in the Constitution. <laughs> for you to make your own uh, call or your own judgment. Again, you know, the law is legible. The law and jurisprudence is legible. And just because you're not a justice of the Supreme Court or a lawyer does not mean that you cannot interpret it. And the, the whole point to law is that everybody can interpret it. And at the final stage, of course, there will be an arbiter to correct what the interpretation would be. So I just start with the Constitution, but I will refer you to other statutes later, Republic Act 3019 and 6713. But the Constitution here says, Section 1, Article 11, public office is a public trust. Public officers and employees must at all times be accountable to the people, serve them with utmost responsibility, integrity, loyalty, and, ef and efficiently, and act with patriotism and justice and lead modest lives. Again. Public officers and employees must at all times uh, act, be accountable to the people, etc. Now, reading this. But public officers are not public officers 100% of the day. In other words, when I step out and go to the mall uh, and uh, buy a cup of coffee, am I a public officer then? What if during that encounter with, let us say, the food server, I happen to say something, and that food server now will make me accountable for that thing which I said, whether it's an opinion or a fact. Like for instance, ang guapo ko, okay? Uh, must be accountable to the public at all times, serve them with utmost responsibility, integrity, and loyalty, no humility there, okay? But the point there is, what if we understand that public officers are not 100% public officers, that they do not check their entire liberties as a human being because there is another provision in the Constitution. Human dignity is intrinsic in everybody. And therefore, we are not automatons as public officers. Now, where do you draw the line between a complete human being acting not as a public officer and acting as a public officer? I leave that question. I hope you think about it, and I hope you debate about it and discuss it because at a certain point, uh, courts will have to decide. Let me clarify something. You know, courts are not hermeneutically sealed from what is happening outside. I can say that for a fact, and that's a verifiable fact. Uh, in my chamber, I have a television, and I have a computer, and you know that I am in Twitter, and you know that I can access web pages, and you know that there is algorithm galore all over. So when I do Google, and I don't, I use DuckDuckGo. And sometimes I do not even use my Safari, I use a Tor in order to be, it slows, slows it down. But on the other hand, sometimes I just want to see Lyonen and that Manila Times article not coming out. <laughs> uh, so please don't click it again, okay, uh, for my sake. But the point there is, that we are not as cons from the public, and therefore, we also listen to uh, a lot of uh, public opinion. Okay. 
question? So, good afternoon. I am JC Del Doc from uh, St. Paul University, Manila, a campus journalist. So, um, considering that uh, I'm a journalist and I want to see all perspective of things, all stories, all sides of it. So, uh, I, in amidst of all criticisms that the judi judiciary branch face today, so how in correlation to what you said earlier that uh, and Miss Maria Reza's uh, statement to hold the line, so how does the judiciary branch hold the line today that especially they are, you are faced with a lot of criticisms regarding uh, I'm, sure, I'm sorry if my voice is shaking because I'm so nervous right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm in presence of my journalistic idols like Ms. Maria Reza, so <laughs> I'm very nervous. <laughs> so <laughs> how does the, and so going back, how does the, judi the judiciary branch uh, hold the line or be uh, very unbiased on its reactions or its decisions on the court in the midst of all the criticis criticisms that you face today. Thank you. I thought you were scared of my warrants. Okay, Maria Reza ka pala takot. Uh, don't worry, I think Rappler will hire you when you graduate. Uh, in, in spite of your question or whatever your question was. Okay, but... Uh, my, uh, my response to that is, uh, well, holding the line, okay? And uh, the conservatives in government, conservatives, and I would just want to classify them very broadly vis-a-vis uh, -vis the progressives in government, also think that they're holding the line. Um, when we debated the RH law, I saw how passionate the advocates were, and I, I saw how passionate the deliberations were also within the court, within the framework, uh, framework of law. So again, um, there are lots of criticisms on the judiciary, but when has the judiciary ever been free of any kind of criticism? In fact, its legitimacy resides, I think, in its ability to be able to cause more criticism because then it can ferret out the true position, the truthful position, the better position that, it, uh, that, that we come out with. You know, impartiality, to be impartial does not mean to be ignorant. You can be impartial holding on several views that you have of what society is. And you have to inform yourself. You cannot decide the cybercrime law or the constitutionality of that law if you cannot operate a computer. You cannot decide a cyber libel if you do not know what a like means in Facebook. You cannot decide that. You cannot decide that case of Hun Sen as to whether or not it is uh, legal or constitutional within their parameters of buying uh, followers from the Philippines, at, I think the news, news article read, from the Philippines from all sources without informing yourself. And I think holding the line also involves knowing, also involves critical analysis of uh, the information that you get. Great, I think we're running out of time. Um, Justice Leon, I know you had uh, one closing statement, but before I do, I wanted to mention Google. When I was Googling you, um, I found it really interesting, autocomplete, when you type in Justice Leon, an autocomplete has dissenting opinion. <laughs> um, I'd like to offer the closing, of the, 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 the closing statement for to today's entire session um, to perhaps arguably the loneliest man on the, on the bench, ladies and gentlemen, Justice Leon. Uh, with your indulgence, so I'm careful, I prepared a, uh, a statement and uh, do you want to use the... Yeah, no, no, I, I'm okay here, if, it's, if that's fine with you. And uh, um, it's not nice to be lonely. Sometimes you do not want to be always on the dissenting side. Sometimes you want to be on the majority. Um, again, thank you for the privilege. Uh, just so you're clear about my standpoint, my legal career before I was appointed to the judiciary mostly entailed working with groups who are mostly labeled as rural, indigenous or peasant. I have also worked with families of the disappeared and victims of human rights violations. I have made representations at various levels of courts, including the Supreme Court, as well as in various administrative bodies and in the halls of Congress. For more than 20 years, I traveled to where they live, literally traversing mountains in this country, crossing rivers, sleeping in huts or in shanties. 
Occasionally, we would find ways to find the logistics for them to be present in legal forums in the halls of Senate or Congress, or the Departments of Environment and Natural Resources, Department of Agrarian Reform, and sometimes the Office of the President. They would appear before our trial courts on several occasions. They were with me at the session hall as we argued their cases. In my younger days, and I am still young, <laughs> I thought that part of my vocation was to seek to be able to speak for them in legal and policy forums. I was to give them a voice translated into the language of the law, ensuring that their rights are asserted and protected and monitoring that their interests are represented as new laws are re and regulations are drafted. Communities, however, are complicated. They are not the ordinary clients of lawyers. They are unlike individuals, unlike cooperatives, unlike corporations. Communities are multivocal. There are, several, there are several groups, identities, and sectors which speak from different standpoints even as they inherently reside in their common spaces. They always tend to be dynamic as there are always the interplay of the perspective, strategy, and power within the community as well as the various sectors and groups that exist among them. They are always multidimensional since their cult cultures go through levels and phases of conflict and accommodation. In every group or community, Power makes its mark. Those who have it have their own complex basis of power. The interplay of power often defines the elite. They sustain and reflect the status quo. Culture contains, therefore, the powerful hegemonic view. The hegemonic view, however, is not entirely monolithic and not absolutely dominant. Culture will have its own versions of its own subversive elements. As Lenin did say, the a new society is always born in the womb of an old one. What Lenin with an E-N-I-N, -E not Leonin. <laughs> what I understand with working with indigenous and peasant communities was that I could never really speak for them. I can only speak about them. When I speak about them, I relay a narrative of how I understood their lives and interests. Like every narrative, even if told with good intentions, it was never from a standpoint that was truly theirs. Gayatri Spivak, a celebrated historian, once asked through her essay, can the subaltern really speak? For many who have understood the complexity of community and society, like many of you in the audience now, the answer is indicatively obvious. Even if we strive to be accurate, our narratives are never complete no matter how collective we are. They are and should always be vulnerable and open to contestation. Words are the currency of narratives and their challenges. Words are colorful. They describe as well as perform. Open, robust, and uninhibited discussion is rarely soothing. Democratic deliberation is not a guarantee of comfort. Given the inequality in our society and the stakes of those who benefit from the status quo, democratic deliberation is often brusque. I refer not only to the reaction of those in government to your speech, but likewise those from fellow citizens, whether they themselves are organized by powerful interests. Rational, democratic, and egalitarian discussion before they happen, therefore go through cer certain phases and reincarnations. They are reformed over and over again. Many of you in the audience, however, know how it is to be the subject of the discomfort of the powerful, whether this be public officials or dominant economic players in our society. Today, this can also come from those who are what I call the culturally dominant. Roughly, this includes the cyber bullies who use their status for nefarious ends. By now you know that social media is generally crowdsourced speech of the owners of the platform. Internet companies and their forums are not entirely neutral conduits of content. They are businesses that wish to thrive and uh, who have responsibilities to their stockholders. The space you use is not for, for free. You pay it dearly, at minimum with your privacy, at maximum with your addiction. Social media grows, because of our patronage, we empower it with every post, every like, every tweet, every retweet. It has the ability to inform. More dangerously, it also has the ability to attention, create digital amnesia, and dull critical thinking. We have to be aware of all this and guard against them. 
we, this society depends on that. During the conversation with Peter, I have briefly outlined the constitutional architecture that protects your right to expression. The doctrines that have evolved are mostly to protect the rights to express vis-a-vis -vis government and to limit the ability of government to stifle dissent. There are many occasions the court has played the role of checking these exercises of power while clarifying the various nuances of the constitutional provisions on freedom of expression. There are, however, many more cases where it took some time or is taking some time for the court to acknowledge that there, are, there may be reasons to revisit judicial thinking on some of the strategies that have been used in the, in the past. Laws are powerful performative normative statements that can be used in order to expose illegality and at times illegitimacy. However, these have the possibility to become inert if not invoked or weakened when the institutions that ensure their clarity fail to do so. I refer to judicial decisions, which may not be entirely appropriate to the times. I refer to ju uh, your role, therefore, is to use your constitutional rights and invoke them. Your role is also to use your fundamental freedoms to express criticism of court decisions, which you may disagree with. You are welcome to do so. Hopefully, this will lead to some interesting rethinking and the evolution of past doctrines. Freedom of expression, however, is not only about our capability to express. It should also include questions of equality in the public, in the public forum. But there are greater, more social ways that deliberative speech from those who need them most are, mo are being stifled. Already the poor, marginalized, and oppressed do not have the resources to be able to speak as clearly, as legibly, and as loudly as many of us. Many of those I have encountered in my public interest practice do not inhabit my groups or your groups in social media. For them, few of them can call the attention of journalists. Many of them suffer in continued silence. While whole swaths of our society remain misrepresented, misunderstood, and on a daily basis rendered invisible by the speech that now dominate the airwaves. Their daily concerns and their ability to be able to meet the requirements of daily existence are drowned by the scandals of the elite that diverted attention to the trivialities of the smartphone and social media, the banality, or as someone in your earlier panel intimated, the lack of sexiness of their stories. Yet these are sometimes true stories whose accuracy is not diminished by the absence of attention. True stories of those who do not have the ability to speak as significantly as others. True stories that do not have drama. In other words, the deliberations in the institutions that matter, the academe, the media, the public offices, and perhaps even social media, may be so involved that it detaches itself from the underlying reality that have made many of our problems possible. These are poverty, disempowerment, inequality in a society that valorizes individualism, wealth, and the quick fix. No wonder there is so much dis disenchantment, not only with our leaders, but with how our society is organized the way it is and the way it matters to them. No matter that many peoples, including our own, will look for the false messiah in the form of a demagogue, a populist, or called by the name preferred by Albert Camus, Thomas Mann, and more recently, Rob Reimer. They call them the fascists. Demagogues, this is just a warning, I'm not referring to anyone. <laughs> Demagogues can arise out of legal frames that are formally democratic. I'll repeat that. Demagogues can arise out of legal frames that are for formally democratic. Usually, they take advantage of the exclusion and frustration of the majority. They offer quick fixes and represent themselves sharply from the more conscientious leaders who know that the major problems require patience, strategy, and participative resources that take, take time. They prey on the unenlightened. And therefore, they arise when the major institutions that should deliberate on truths are weak, education, media, and the courts. The demagogue thrives on dichotomies, the us versus they syndrome. They also thrive on instinct, passion, and the visual. In uh, psychologist parlance, system one thinking rather than system two. I think that was the point of the last, uh, the last panel. 
They demonize their enemies, often in order to dehumanize them, to stoke passion amongst their followers, while at the same time immunizing them from their humanity. The demagogue will, that will thrive on the dissatisfaction of the many will present no viable ideology and therefore no consistent truth. He or she will be charismatic, anti-politician, and anti-intellectual. Propaganda in the style of Goebbels and Bernays will be very important for him or her. He or she will call it their brand of PR. The antidote to a fascist or a demagogue arising should not be only symptomatic. It requires a systemic, consistent, and patient effort to strengthen our people's critical thinking. It requires that those who have the material luxury to be critical, vocal, and organized like us in order to be able to assist those who would, whose whole day effort is simply to survive, do what is necessary. This requires patience, of which many of the present generation may not have today. It will mostly lead to discomfort. It will mostly lead to the uncomfor uncomfortable dissent. In times of discomfort, I recall the many engagements that I have had with people who are not as fortunate as I. I recall the conversations I have shared and how I know that I am privileged. That is my surest way to tell myself two things that many in our current generation may have forgotten. And these are the two things. First, persevere. Be patient, because the most meaningful and authentic things in this life always come with a lot of patience and effort. There is no quick fix. Second, it is not always about you. I am not the anti-selfie. But the concept of selfie may be is a fitting anti-meme for something that we now really need, to think about others, the others that are invisible, to critically think about where they really are. Perhaps if we all learn to live with, with this, then we will be able to guarantee our fundamental freedoms, not only ours, but also those who are now poor, those who are now marginalized, and those who suffer from the tremendous inequality that exists in our times, those who are invisible to all of us. Thank you very much. Yes. What? what an extraordinary way to end an extraordinary day. Justice Leonin, thank you so much for that. That was a remarkable message and I think one that we all needed to hear. Thank you once again. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that wraps it up for the day. You've been incredibly patient. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thanks very much. Once again, we'd like to thank our partners. Our academic partners, the Department of Journalism of the University of the Philippines, the Department of Communication of the De La Salle University, the Department of Communication of the Ateneo de Manila University, our media partners, Philippine Daily Inquirer, ANC Rappler, our civil society partners, Blog Watch, Citizen Safe, Citizen for Media Freedom and Responsibility, Foundation for Media Alternatives, Friedrich Naumann Foundation, Media Nation, Vera Files.